This is part one to a three-part series on the how-to in gate. There will be two other episodes. One is directed at Jumper in gate, and the other is directed to Hunter in gate. I'd like to invite anyone to help me with an episode for dressage and also breed shows such as AQHA, AHA, and any other organization that might do things just a little bit different. Disclaimer. This podcast series is not intended to replace the instructions, wants, wishes, or style of running a horse show. It is not intended to supersede any show manager, coordinator, or board of directors managing the show. I have had the privilege of working with and for some of the top show managers in the United States. This podcast is comprised of knowledge gained at working with the country's best. It is very likely that your show management team is going to have some different ideas on how things are done. That's how it should be, and that's how you should do them, the way they want you to. This podcast isn't intended to be the book on how it's all done. The fact of the matter is, with all the rule changes and management styles, that is an impossible task. My sole purpose in this podcast series is to give you an idea of what one can expect to happen if you are new to the Engate job. These are my opinions based on years of experience and what does and does not work. It's a heads up of what you might see, and to prepare you just a little bit of what, in my opinion, you should know and or expect when you begin this fantastic trip into the wonderful world of horse shows. Believe it or not, no one person can know it all, and no one person can expect to be perfect all the time. So in this endeavor, I've done the best I can for today. I've always liked this following quote by Donald Miller. When you stop expecting people to be perfect, you can like them for who they are. Welcome to the barn. I'm Jason Curtis, and I am Horse Show Announcer. Everyone that shows horses knows an in-gate person or two. Whether you're a competitor or a trainer, mom, dad, or just the run-of-the-mill horse enthusiast, have you ever really given any thought as to what the job of an in-gate person is supposed to be? Maybe it's something you've often thought you could do yourself. The in-gate area is where all the action is. Lots of nerves, tempers, tension, and sometimes tantrums. And yes, even cheers and sometimes tears. An in-gate person needs to know not to play favorites. Sure, there are going to be people you know and like, maybe even some people you don't like. There will be some big names that come to your gate. But remember that some of those younger riders will someday be a big name. And those amateur riders, they pay for everyone to be at the horse shows. You always want to be polite to the trainers, competitors, moms and dads, and sponsors. Be nice to them, and hopefully... They'll be nice to you, especially when things go wrong. And trust me, they will go wrong. How many of you know that a particular in-gate person cringes when they see you coming because you are always a pain in the butt? Let's be real. You're out there, and chances are you know who you are. And maybe you don't care anyway. Shame on you. Have you ever thought that maybe the in-gate, any in-gate person, could be a very valuable tool for you and your clients? I mean, seriously, folks, if you tried to be a little nice and work with them instead of against them, not only your life and that of your clients, not to mention the Engate person, could be so much better. If you are listening to this and wondering what I'm talking about, chances are you are one of the good guys. But you've definitely seen the trainers and stage moms and dads lose their shit at the Engate because they're just unhappy people. So the very basics. As an in-gate, you'll need to be at the show at least 45 minutes prior to the start of your ring. You'll need to go a few places. The show office. The show coordinator's office. Wherever you were told to pick up your things in the morning. Please tell me you are not showing up the day of the show to get a layout of the place, and maybe you are already familiar with the show ground as you've been here before. You'll want to know where your booth is, where the judge's booth is, the bathroom, and where lunch will be coming from. You'll need to grab a radio class sheets, maybe a ribbon box, and you'll want to make sure the water jug is full and you have plenty of cups for whoever wants or needs water at your in-gate. You'll have introduced yourself to the jump crew, working your ring, and said good morning. You'll have introduced yourself to the judge or say hello every morning to them. Check on them from time to time and see if they need anything. Be proactive. You stop by the bathroom, even if you don't need to go. It may be a few hours before you get another chance to do so. 
by the time you actually get to your assigned end gate, hopefully there are people already there waiting for you to tell you their plan for the day. It doesn't matter if you don't know who all the trainers and writers are yet. Sure, it helps, but if you are stepping up to a new show for the first time, you have a voice, you have a radio, and you have the class sheets, hopefully. Deal with the most immediate issues first, whatever that is. You can organize your booth if no one is around yet. Now, trainers, riders, moms, and dads, want to keep your in-gate person happy? Be on time. Want to make them really happy? Be polite. Courtesy goes a long way. The one thing any in-gate person or judge doesn't want is an empty gate. If you or other trainers and riders just add 30 to 45 seconds to a ring by being late or unavailable, you have extended everyone's day that needs to be at that ring. The in-gate, the judge, jump crew, EMT, the vet, show steward, show coordinator, office staff, and yeah, the announcer. What is the actual job of an in-gate? Let's imagine the in-gate person is like air traffic control. Their job is to get horses in and out of the ring as smoothly as possible with minimal fuss, stress, and drama, and that's it, right? Yeah, no. If it were that easy, there would not be professional in-gate people. A professional in-gate person is a time manager with many moving parts. Horses, riders, trainers. And I haven't even gotten to the show manager, the coordinator, the water and drag times, jump crew, course designers, course walks. Their judges, hey, how about a bathroom break and my favorite time of day, lunch. And when and how are they going to eat that lunch and keep everything going? Then all of a sudden someone gets tossed from their horse and we need the EMT, vet, and the show steward. Job one for the end gate, control the chaos. Communication. Communication is the key to everything. You want your horse to go somewhere? You've got to tell it, right? Same for end gate. You want to go in the ring? Hey, great. You see those people over there? Yeah, they do too, and they might have a conflict, as might you. Have you, as a trainer or rider, been to the end gate yet to let them know you are even there? I mean to show for the day, and more specifically for that class or a class coming up. Have you checked if they have a list or a dry erase board? Have you stopped by just to say good morning? Have you taken a look at the course plan for your classes? If you want an in-gate person to ever help you, it might not be a bad idea to be prepared. All right, prospective in-gate person, you are going to your first show ever to work in in-gate. What do you need to know? Well, everything you can, and be on your toes. Be well-rested. Be wearing comfy shoes or boots. Eat a good breakfast that will get you by for a few hours. Bring a raincoat, pens to write with and your sense of humor because you are going to need it. Communication goes two ways, right? Well, for you it goes many different ways. If you think the only job you have to do is give the judge and announcer the next back number to go into the ring, you are sadly mistaken, and let's face it, most trainers and riders are not going to check in with you, so let's start hurting cats. I hate to do this here, but as I said, communication is key. Let's assume you don't know how to use a two-way radio. Just humor me. Every radio has an on-off button, a way to turn that volume up and down, and a way to change the channel. There might be a few more functions, but every radio will have these basic functions. Here is something many people don't understand, and it's simple. When a person pushes the button to broadcast what they have to say, or if the button is mashed unknowingly, no one else on the channel can be heard. Let me put this another way. If you hear someone else on that channel, don't just think what you have to say is more important, even if it is. Because when you mash that button to talk and have just cut off whatever the other person was saying, not only will they have to repeat themselves, but whatever you have just said will not be heard either. And you too will have to repeat yourself, basically wasting everyone's time. Two-way radios are a one-at-a-time system, unlike telephones, where you can interrupt and talk over each other. Here's a scenario that happens way too often. Let's say the channel you are assigned to is being used by two rings, a hunter ring, and a jumper ring. You are working the jumper ring, and you have seen 10 of 25 competitors in a class. The hunter ring has just finished a division, and the judge is giving results to the hunter ring in gate and announcer. 
You now have a horse about to go into the ring, but you haven't been able to give the number to your judge because the hunter judge is going on and on because they are giving two sets of results that are 12 numbers each. Yeah, it happens. What do you think would happen if you just push the button and start talking to your judge? And the hunter ring is giving those results to the other end gate and the announcer is already writing this information down. Not only have you blocked everything the hunter judge was saying, they will have to repeat it and whatever you said will need to be repeated as well. The hunter judge won't be impressed. The end gate won't be impressed. And chances are the announcer is going to let you know you broke cardinal rule number two. You have wasted the time of at least five people. First time might be forgiven. Second time, and it's me announcing, we will certainly have a radio conversation. The takeaway here is, I hope, if someone else is talking, you are listening for pertinent information, even if it does not apply to your ring. Here's a small pro tip. If you are in the jumper ring, and the hunter ring is giving huge numbers of results, and you just have one card open, it is okay to let the writer go. The judge at some point is likely to see the back number. A jumper judge also has the privilege of being able to start the rider with a buzzer, bell, or whistle, whereas a hunter judge likely has multiple cards and needs the info you'll provide. So back to basic radio. Cardinal rule number one. For some of us, the first cardinal rule is the most difficult to get, but it's the simplest. Think before you speak. Decide what you are going to say and to whom it is meant for. Pretty simple, right? Pause before speaking. When you first press the push to talk button, there can be a short delay before your radio transmits. This could result in your first couple of syllables being cut off. So wait about half a second before speaking to be sure your listeners receive your whole message. Most important thing here is be patient. The other person may not be able to respond immediately. Give them time to reply before resending your call. Use short, clear, and concise messages. As two-way radios only allow one person to speak at a time, it's best to keep your transmission short, clear, and to the point. This gives other users an opportunity to acknowledge your message or request further clarification before you carry on with your next point. Use good manners. Avoid long and complicated sentences. Use brief messages if possible. This is not a call-in show where you talk about what happened last night and remember... These radios are everywhere, so if you don't want others to hear what you have to say, use a text message. Your voice should be clear. Speak a little slower than normal. Speak in a normal tone. Do not use abbreviations or slang unless they are all well understood by the group. You don't have to yell into any radio. Your normal speaking voice is adequate as long as your mouth is six to eight inches away from the microphone. Another tip. Learn the lingo. It helps two-way radio communication when everyone understands and uses similar language and etiquette, especially when there are more than two people using the channel. Big pro tip. Many shows today have what's called brick radios for the end gates. What's a brick radio? A brick radio is a second radio. Maybe not always the same type as you use to communicate with your judge and other people. This is really meant for conversations between the end gates, so the judges aren't overhearing all the conversations about we can't find this trainer or do you have so-and-so. An example of my typical show where I announce four and sometimes five rings is pretty straightforward. Office, EMT, vet, and steward are always on channel one. Channel three is the main jumper ring and the main hunter ring. Channel five is hunter two and jumper two. The other ring will be on another channel, usually six if we are using it. Jump crew is on channel four and the brick is on channel seven. All the barn calls are on channel 11, and as in gate, you will do barn calls. While you may be listening to only two radios, an announcer might be listening to multiple at the same time. So communication is key, right? If you are at the main hunter ring and you have a rider fall, you need to know without thinking about it what channel you need to go to so you can call the EMT and vet if needed. A really big problem occurs if you don't change back to channel 3, your assigned channel. The judge might be trying to talk to you. The announcer might be trying to talk to you. If you are not back on the channel people know you are assigned to, they can't talk to you. Then they might start trying you on the brick, which hopefully you haven't turned that volume down in the meantime. 
The takeaway is be available on your main channel whenever you are not on another channel and keep any conversations you might be having on another channel short so you are back to your assigned ring radio channel. Trainers, writers, moms, and dads, if you have a spot on the posted order of go, you need to be there. If you put your name on a list earlier in the day and you are not going to make that spot, you need to let the in-gate person know. If you have scratched, you need to let the in-gate person know. If you've added a class, it is most important that you let the in-gate person know. It is the job of the in-gate person to get everyone on their class list into the ring. If the ad slip is in your pocket, tack trunk, backpack, grooming box, it is impossible for the in-gate to do their job effectively. If it is easier, you as an exhibitor can always talk to any in-gate and have them radio the ring for you. This can save you having to go to another ring just to give them information. The best in-gates will be the ones that are organized and proactive. They will get cell numbers of trainers or head grooms of those that have large numbers in their classes. In today's world of text messaging and quick phone calls, communication is truly at your fingertips. Top in-gate staff should have already figured out how long their day should be based on each division's entry numbers, trips, jogs, under saddles, presentations, waters and drags, and should be able with a glance to tell you how long till a specific division or class. Hey, when will the green pony start? If there was an unexpected delay, times will obviously change, but you get the idea. Typically, each hunter trip is two minutes from entry to exit. Water and drag takes about 15 to 25 minutes. Depending on staff, course changes, height adjustments are done by experienced jump crew should take 5 to 15 minutes. A little help from my friends. From time to time, a judge will not be able to see all or part of a fence. Sometimes they will be able to see a back rail and not a front rail or vice versa. They will ask you and the announcer to keep an eye on one or even more fences. So you would radio to the judge if you happen to see a jump come down. If you happen to see a fence come down that the judge hasn't asked you to be looking out for and the judge calls a clear round, don't be afraid to let them know what fence fell. If you are fast enough and the judge agrees, then the announcer will announce a correct score too. That is not to say you should dispute what the judge has said. Rather, you are bringing it to their attention. Now, this is something kind of important. I cannot stress this enough. Be careful not to say anything to help the competitor in the ring. If you notice a rider about to go off course, don't say anything. If they forget to jump the last fence and the clock is still running, don't ask the judge why the clock is still running. Bear in mind, the trainer and or another interested party is probably standing close to you. Show employees cannot be seen to assist one rider and not the others. The answer is not to say anything. Don't accidentally get involved. Top end gates also know what the course plan is. This is not so you can tell a competitor or trainer what the course is. It's so you can communicate with a jump crew and or the judge what fences might be down. Now, we've touched on this just for a second, but if anyone adds in a drawn order, they must go to the top of that order. If they've added more than one horse, contact the show office to see personal sequence and where in the order the second ride is to go. No one is allowed to go out of their own personal sequence when multiple rides are involved. What does that mean? If a rider has more than one horse, they must ride those subsequent horses in the drawn order. They are not allowed to just move horses around as long as they fill their spot. The drawn order is part of the competition. Something that will happen at every show is at some point multiple in gates will be looking for the same trainer or rider, and in some instances even the same horse. So all planning can and will be shot out the window when everything comes to a grinding halt. This is especially so at smaller shows. This is where in-gates start working together to solve the log jam as best possible. A trainer that is supposed to be at multiple rings should contact an in-gate, and the in-gates amongst themselves should make a plan, not the trainer. Well, why not the trainer? The trainer only knows what their clients are doing and not everyone else. Sure, they'd like to be in charge, but look at it this way. If one ring has 24 trips and another ring only has four, and those four are all the trainer in question, it makes most sense to send the trainer to the ring with four trips, as another trainer and more can keep the ring with 24 trips going. 
It will help immensely if the trainer doesn't just go where they think they need to be and go by the end gates working together to stop two or more rings being on hold. It is important that the end gates talk to one another in this type of situation. Everyone at the show should know the jargon and the math of horse shows. The estimated time per trip is two minutes per round or trip. Some rings are larger, so you would estimate three minutes. Ten horses in a division with two trips. Another way to put it is ten to see twice, ten to go twice, and or twenty trips. You as the end gate and those around you will automatically know that this division will take forty minutes. Okay, so we just covered the most obvious part of the end gate person's job, but there is so much more. Before I go on any further, I want to let you in on another pro tip. If you hear a competitor, trainer, or parent complaining about anything, call the show coordinator to your ring via radio or phone. Maybe even text them what is going on. Don't say the stuff over the radio. If it's a question about a rule or maybe the judge made a mistake, do not get involved. Call the show coordinator. Do not call the judge. Do not express your own opinion. Call the coordinator first, and they will contact the steward if needed, or they will instruct you to do so if they can't make it to you. Whatever you do, do not take the issue into your own hands. How do you know who is supposed to be in each class? Class sheets. Class sheets will be provided to you. These may vary from show secretary to show secretary, but hopefully they all provide the needed basic information: an entry number, rider name, trainer name. Some of the class sheets include more info. It's more for the announcer than you, but sometimes you might need to announce a class too. That'll be another podcast. Typically, you'll have a sheet per class, trip, or round. So let's say there are six people in the class, any class. When that person enters the ring, you put a distinguishable mark near the number or name. You'll develop your own system, but commonly in the hunters, it's a slash one way or the other near the entry number. That way, when they come back for the second trip, the slash goes the other direction. When both trips are done, you have an X near the entry number. I use this method, and if they are doing the warm up, I put a check mark above the number. Some in gates use stars or just squiggles. Sometimes they will only do a single trip. When they are just doing one trip, I will put a DNS to let me know they did not start the other trip. If an entry is a scratch, I put an SC in the box where the number is. Either way, consistency and the ability for someone to take over for you and understand quickly your system is best. Now, for a little bit of a touchy part of the in-gate job, let's say your judge says, "I've already seen this horse in this class. What does one do now?" First, the judge will continue judging the trip, and that's when diplomacy comes in. When that trip is over, you need to have a conversation with the judge. Not on the radio. Even with the best communication skills in the world, sometimes mistakes will happen. Be ready to answer any questions a judge might toss at you, but be accurate and don't guess. You'll probably need someone to stop others from coming into the ring while you have stepped away. This is where, if you are friendly with the jump crew, they can help you. Hopefully, you have been able to work things out with a judge, and all is fine. Otherwise, it's another call to the show coordinator. We've touched on ad slips earlier, but it needs to be reiterated here. Ads are great for the show. They are good for you too, but only if they come to you timely. Ads and scratches are usually done on the same paper form, so you'll need to take a good look at them. Is it an ad? Is it a scratch? Is it both? What the form should contain is the class number, a back number, a rider name, and a horse's name. If they don't include at least a rider's name and horse's name when they are handed to you. Don't let that person walk away. The back number you can get when they show up at the end gate. Well, why do you need this information? First of all, the announcer will hardly ever get an ad slip. Typically, we don't care about scratches. Ads are much more important because we need the info to announce them. Otherwise, it'll just be a mystery horse rider combination announced on the PA. Big pro tip here: keep your ad and scratch sheets. If someone says I didn't scratch, you've got the sheet. If they want to re-enter. They need to go to the office. If they added and you are looking for them, they might say, "I didn't add." Well, here's the sheet. If the office asks you for it back for any reason, you can get it back to them. If the info is requested by anyone or maybe there was a mistake, it can be explained. I gotta say, the hardest part of the job is actually getting riders into the ring or to show up at all. 
If you have noticed you are coming to the end of your entries and you have not seen number so-and-so, what do you do? First, you contact other end gates to see if they have the trainer. You'll need the trainer's name, the back number, and the horse rider info handy. If not, you start making barn calls to call the trainer or rider. Still no joy? You contact the office to see if they've scratched or failed to pick up numbers, which means they're not even on the showgrounds, and we can move on. If they have, then you need to contact the show coordinator to see if they can physically locate the competitor. If they can't find the trainer, rider, or horse, listen to the instructions of the coordinator. You might want to ask if you can put three minutes on the gate. If it comes to that, you need to let people at the end gate know you have put three minutes on the gate. And at one and a half minutes, you'll need to let them know one and a half minutes on the gate, and then 30 seconds. Then you'll announce the class is closed. You'll then move on. If the missing competitor does show up and the jump crew is already setting for the next division or fence height, the show has done everything possible to find them. Be prepared because you will get the brunt force of whoever it is. So call the coordinator. That is their job. Let them handle it. Follow their instructions and move on. Results. At some point, a class and division will come to an end, and results will be given by the judge, or judges. Some judges are very fast with their results. If you're not paying attention, you could miss the judge starting to give you results. Hopefully, the announcer is writing them down. Then you can get them from the announcer via text or brick radio. Ribbon boxes. It's oftentimes your job to hand out ribbons. Dress appropriately since you may have to make presentations to a winner. Keep track of all the results and make sure you only give ribbons to the person who won them. When judges give results, write them down. Then tick off the numbers as you give out ribbons. Make sure you keep track of who you gave ribbons to. You'll figure out your own system. You should always pay attention to what's happening in and around your ring at all times. One of the most important jobs is telling the judge or announcer the number in the ring, but you must manage your gate and warm-up area as well. Balance between running your ring, warm-up, and other in gates. As the eyes and ears are on the ground and oftentimes close to the action, you should be watching and listening to what's going on in your immediate area. If someone falls, you should be calling the EMT, period. It doesn't matter if they're okay. Do it anyway. Let the EMT make that decision. That's what they are paid for. You should know if a rail goes down and alert the jump crew. If it's near your gate, go set it up. Know your jump crew names. No one wants to be, hey you. Give them the same respect you want in return. Alert jump crew when you are approaching a course change. Tell them what the next class to build will be. They don't always know if a class hasn't filled. Water and drag. Part of your job is to discuss with the show coordinator when the water and drag should take place. If there is a major course change coming up, this might make a natural time for ring maintenance. The water and drag will vary day to day based on weather and numbers of competitors showing in that ring. Windy days can cause havoc not only for jump crew trying to keep fences from falling down, but also because the wind will remove the moisture from the footing. If it happened to rain the previous night, no doubt the jump crew have been working for hours to make everything as good as they can. One way to keep the jump crew working with you is if you see a fence is down, hold up the next rider at the gate. Don't let the competitor go into the ring until the jump crew have at least had a chance to realize the fence is down. Again, if the jump is near you, maybe you can put it back up or help the jump crew do it. Sometimes they are on the complete other side of the ring and even the simple help of an in gate is appreciated. If the entire fence came down, well, they're going to need to make sure it is back in the right place anyway. Leaving the in gate. So here is something just to consider. If your judge can't leave until there's a break, neither can you. Now, this is not a rule, but if you must walk away, take your radio with you. Do not leave the end gate unless there is a major pause in the action. And if you do leave, let the judge and announcer know you are walking away. And if you can, have someone cover for you while you step away. Also, this may seem obvious, but when the ring is done for the day, let the judge know. By doing so, you will have informed the announcer. But always let the other rings, jump crew, office, and show coordinator know too. Your job is to keep the ring moving. 
It's your job to nag, cajole, call, or push them into keeping the ring moving. You are not pals with the competitors. Be friendly, but be firm. Look, no one can think of everything an in-gate person might be called upon to handle. It is a tough and oftentimes underappreciated job, but a really good in-gate person can make this a great living. Who else gets to go outside, be around horses all day, and get paid while doing it? Okay, many people, but if you are a horse person who likes people and helping out, this is a great position at any horse show. If you ever have any questions about being an in-gate person, hunter, jumper, dressage, or whatever, I am always happy to talk to you. My name is Jason Curtis, and I am Horse Show Announcer.